In the first part of our story, we learned that the classic video game console was invented by three different companies at the same time. In this episode, we'll take a closer look at the resulting systems. The Fairchild Channel F, the Atari 2600, and the Magnavox Odyssey 2. Their designers pitted their creativity against the limitations of computing technology as it existed in the 1970s. And the resulting systems are full of quirks but still cast a spell on gamers and game programmers decades later. Video games existed before these consoles, but this is where video games as we know them now really began. Even at a glance, it was easy to tell these three systems apart. The Fairchild Channel F looked like a clock radio, with a black plastic top and wood grain sides. Game cartridges were loaded horizontally on the front panel and removed with an eject button, like the cassette deck in an old car stereo. To modern eyes, the most distinct feature of the Channel F was its controller. Instead of the joystick that was typical of the era, the Channel F controller was gripped in the palm and had a triangular knob at the top. The knob had a surprising degree of movement. The knob could be tilted, forward, back, left and right like a joystick, twisted in either direction, or pushed down or pulled up. This allowed Channel F games to have more complex control schemes than other systems. In the ice hockey game, for example, Players moved their on-screen hockey sticks by tilting the knob and changed the angle by rotating the knob. Pushing and pulling the knob moved the separate goalie up and down. The Atari 2600 boasted a similar combination of black plastic and wood grain stickers, but its controller was much simpler, a joystick with a button. Cartridges were inserted vertically and removed simply by pulling them out of the slot. The Odyssey 2 console also had a vertical slot and a joystick and button controller, but it was set apart by having a full alphanumeric keyboard. The keyboard had flat membrane keys, like the buttons on a microwave oven, and wasn't much fun to type on, but it gave the Odyssey 2 an input functionality the other systems couldn't match. The systems also differed in how they created their graphics, which resulted in distinct visual styles in their games. On the Channel F, graphics were created using a paint-by-numbers system. The screen is divided into a grid of dots called pixels, and the color of each pixel is determined by a number stored in Random Access Memory, or RAM. Originally, displays that used this technique just had two colors, so the number stored was either a zero or a one, known as a bit. And because of that, this technique is known as bitmapped graphics. This is the most flexible way of creating a video display. And today, virtually all displays, video games, computers, smartphones, use this system. However, it requires enough RAM to store the color data for every pixel on the screen. And during the era of the Channel F, this was an expensive drawback. The Atari 2600, in contrast, avoided most of the RAM overhead by taking advantage of how displays periodically update the colors on the screen, a procedure known as a screen refresh. Starting in the upper left corner, pixels are updated working left to right, top to bottom. The Atari 2600 didn't have RAM for every pixel on the screen, but instead, had enough for just one row's worth of pixel data. During the short interval between finishing the refresh of one row and starting the next, games had to swap out the data needed to display the next row. Atari programmers called this racing the beam. In fact, the display RAM wasn't even enough to specify the color of every pixel on a row. It actually specified only half of the row. Programs could tell the display hardware to either duplicate the pixels for the right half of the row or to use the pixel data in reverse order. This is why many Atari 2600 games had play fields that were horizontally symmetrical. This single line bitmap was only used to create the backgrounds of the Atari 2600 games. 
But the objects that moved, such as the tanks and shells in this combat game, the console used sprites, which are smaller grids of bitmap pixels that can be independently positioned anywhere on the screen. The Atari's sprites used smaller pixels than the background, and together, the two graphic systems gave Atari games a signature look. The Odyssey 2 created backgrounds in an entirely different way from the other two consoles, building maze-like patterns from line segments that could be individually turned on or off. In many games, the player could use the keyboard to create a custom game layout. A good example is Monkey Shines, Essentially a game of tag between one or two human players and a group of angry monkeys, players could use the keyboard to add or remove individual monkey bars during play. The Odyssey 2 had sprites for the moving objects in the foreground, such as the monkeys and players in this game, and could also draw letters and numbers to the screen. As with the original Odyssey, some Odyssey 2 games had accessories that extended the game beyond the television screen. One example was Conquest of the World. The game was primarily played on a fold-out map with rules similar to the classic board game Risk, except that instead of rolling dice to determine who won a battle, players would fight it out on the screen. From these descriptions, the three systems appear closely matched. Each had strengths and weaknesses, but these weren't obvious to consumers, especially considering most were seeing video games for the first time. And yet, the three consoles performed very differently in the marketplace. The Fairchild Channel F, despite being the first to the market, performed the worst, selling about 250,000 units total. The Odyssey 2 performed much better, with approximately 2 million units sold worldwide. But the Atari 2600 was the clear winner, with an astounding 30 million units sold over a market life of nearly 15 years. Atari sold so well that the word became synonymous with video games, like Kleenex for tissue. So what happened? Why did one system rise so far above its competition? We'll answer that in the last episode of this story.